Hallelujah. Lift your hands to heaven this morning and reach out. Reach out to the Lord today. We can never do anything without him. Hallelujah. This morning, Father, we look to the rock. You are the rock that we look to. You are the foundation of our lives. You are everything, Lord. And this morning, we acknowledge you, the Lord and the Savior of our lives. We thank you today for speaking to every heart and every soul. Thank you, Lord God, for preparing the hearts of your children, Lord God, for what is coming. We know you are coming soon. We know that we're going to see you soon, Father. We just want to thank you for the process of knowing you, Father God, on our way. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. And thank you, Lord God, for doing such an amazing work in every heart and every soul today. We just want to welcome the Holy Spirit today to touch us and give us not just knowledge, but give us revelation knowledge of the Word of God so we can live our lives by the truth and nothing else. In Jesus' mighty name, we just want to thank you and give you all the glory for it. In the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Come on, give Jesus all the praise one more time. God bless you can take your seats today. Praise the Lord. So glad you came. I know there are many people away this morning. They're still on holidays. Um, they'll be back tomorrow. We're back to normal. Praise the Lord. Next Sunday, everybody will be in the house. So we want to welcome you, especially the new ones today. Hope you feel comfortable sitting in, um, among us and uh, hearing the Word of God today. This is my third Sunday. I believe it's the third Sunday or the fourth Sunday. I don't, I don't remember now. Probably the third. Talking about what the Lord wants me to talk about. And that is your personal relationship with the Lord. Your private life. You can call it a private life. Or your intimacy with God. Your intimacy with God. It dawned on me, um, many things happen in the last days, and one of the most dangerous, and I would say dangerous things, um, that will happen, and sometimes we don't pay attention to it. Um, if they can put for me on the screen, please, Matthew 24. Uh, verse 8 and on, a couple of verses after that. Matthew 24 and verse 8. Jesus talking, of course, about in the light of the end times and end days. All this is but the beginning. He's talking about war and rumors of war and all of that. All this is but the beginning. The early pains of the birth pains of the intolerable anguish that's going to hit the earth. Verse 9. Then they will hand you over to suffer affliction and tribulation and put you to death. That's talking about the followers of Jesus or the people who are living a righteous life, living for God. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, if you read that, sometimes you, probably a question comes up in, inside of you. So didn't God say he protects us? Didn't God say he'll protect us? Yeah, he did. But that contradicts what God says. And I always like to challenge by the word of God, because I know the word of God, there's no contradiction in it. Right? And I said it in the prayer room in the back today. I'd rather suffer in the will of God than have it easy outside God's will. This is not a ground to be offended and ask, where are you, God? 
when I am going through the most difficult and rough and tough times in my life. Now, keep, keep that verse first, nine. Again, nine, please. And they will hand you over to suffer affliction. Suffering affliction and tribulations and put you to death. There are some who will actually die for the testimony of Jesus. They will die. They will actually die. And they will put you to death. So why doesn't God deliver us from that? You know why? It is the testimony. It is the testimony that you give about your faith and about your love for Jesus. He was willing to die, and we need to have that willingness also to actually die for what we believe it is the truth. Hatred from the world will come to the believer. But what keeps you in the midst of all of that? What keeps you? What makes you want to continue? What makes you not give up? What is the key in the face of all of these things that we as Christians face? People will hate you. Sometimes you want to look for people to love you. And the Bible is very clear when you live for God, sometimes you were going to face the issues of, you know, tribulations and afflictions and, 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 and possibly death. There's possibly death. There's possibly death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now verse 10. And then many will be offended. The spirit of offense today in the church is very, very strong. And there are many, many Christians, unfortunately, are actually offended. And it says many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert. Instead of running closer to God... They begin to distrust. That tells me you're not intimate with him. Intimacy is built on trust. You know the person. So these people are possibly very, very shallow. They only believed. They only came to Christ. They only believed. But the minute persecution came, the minute affliction hit, the minute difficulties start, the minute things will begin to go the opposite way to what God says, all of a sudden, they are offended. They are offended by who? By God. And the Bible tells us in Peter that he will be a rock of offense. To those who do not believe or to those who do not have that intimate relationship with God. Trust is important. Very, very important. Trust is very important when it comes to having a relationship. You can never be in a relationship if you've lost trust. No matter how hard you try, if there is no trust, there is no relationship. No matter how try, how hard you try to build a relationship with a person that you cannot trust. Fault me if you can and speak right now if you want to. Can you build a relationship with a person that you don't trust? It's impossible. So trust is an issue. And for you to trust God, even when you are going through the difficult time and something that you don't understand, there has to be a trust that God, I know I can trust you with whatever I'm going through. Even if I have to face death, I trust you. 
That is the depth of intimacy that people will begin to develop when they are actually working on their intimacy with God. Serving God was never priority above knowing God. I want to say that again. Serving God was never a priority. The Lord didn't say, serve me first and all these things shall be added unto you. No, he didn't. He said, seek ye first. So the seeking has to come before anything else. To seek the Lord. That means you're after God. That means you're pursuing God with everything that's within you. That means you're so hungry and desperate and so desiring to just live a life that pleases God. You want to know what pleases Him. You want to do the things that pleases Him. Your heart is after Him. Not after what God can do, but Him. And when you seek Him, those other things will begin to take place in your life. Many are offended. They're offended by God. Why am I hated? Why people don't like me? Why people persecuting me? Why am I facing the affliction? Why, 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 why? And all this why is coming from something that called trust. You don't know God enough to trust him. If I, if I don't know my daughter, how can I trust her? If I don't know my son-in-law, how can I trust him? If I don't know um, uh, people that are in my life, how, Nali, how can I, Nali, how can I trust you if I don't know you? Where the trust come from? From knowing, from something that is deeper than just say, hello, how are you? God bless you. Have a great day. And you're gone. And that's what we do with God. Good morning. God bless you, Lord. I'm, I'm so glad I'm your child. And we walk away. And we don't develop such a relationship that's going to take roots and get deeper. Because I need that. Why? Because God knows what I'm going to face. God knows what I'm going to go through. And if I don't have that, I'm going to end up exactly as this word says. I'm going to be offended. And I'm going to question the trust of God. I'm going to question him. Where are you? Why did you allow this to happen to me? Why? And you know that I'm there to serve you. And I'm there to do this. And I'm there to do that. Listen to me carefully. Voice of the Holy Spirit is very, very important. Very important. Fred, Fred talked about, we have a teacher. He talked about that. Sometimes you can talk about it until you're blue in the face. And until you start acting on it and get him involved in your daily life and daily decisions. Well, you know, I'm a free moral agent. I can decide what I want. Well, you're not as smart and a wise enough to know what to do in your life without God. And I hope I am getting across today to the point that something inside of you tells you, you need to make time for God. We make time for everything. And this is human nature. Okay? We make time for our families. We make time to go out. We make time for social life. We make time, even church life. We make time for that. We make time. We come. We left everything this today and we came to church. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that my relationship with God is strong and good. It doesn't mean anything. Let me tell you. A lot of people come to church and go from church the same way as they came, the same way as they go. But when God begins to mess us up in your life and dig deeper in your life and cut things in your life off of your life, that's when you know your relationship with God is getting, listen to the word, serious. 
serious. Don't play around with your relationship with God. Get serious about it. You need to be serious about your relationship. If I'm not hungry, I can't eat. And if I lost my desire for God, I am not going to get that fire back into my spirit. So because of what happens, and there's a lot of things happens in church life. If you are only serving God and your relationship with God is not very strong, you're going to be offended. You're going to be offended. There's no doubt about it. You're going to be offended. And? And repelled and will begin to distrust and desert, desert, walk away from. Deserting is walking away from. When you desert somebody, you walk away from them. When you desert somebody, you're no longer in a relationship with them. When you walk away from something, that means you're leaving it and you're walking away. And who are they going to desert? The church? Are they going to desert the church? That's not what it says here. They desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. We ought to trust and obey God. But there's no way we can trust and obey God unless we have a deeper, more intimate, personal relationship with God. It's possible for you to tell me things about God because you heard it, not because you know it. It's two different things. I was talking to someone on Saturday about the things of God. And when I left that place, I started to pray for that man. And I was saying, Lord, how can a person with that knowledge is still blind? And, and it it's came to me, you can develop knowledge, you can have knowledge. But it's not knowledge. It's the revelation knowledge that you need. And revelation doesn't come to your mind. Revelation comes to your spirit man. God will begin to reveal this knowledge to you. Revelation knowledge is what Jesus said, I will build my church on. The church is not built on knowledge. You can go to Bible school and come out the same way. You can fill your mind with knowledge, with the Word of God, but unless it's a revelation knowledge, it comes to your spirit. The inner side of you that needs to change. God doesn't work on the outside in. God works from the inside out. And unless He start the work from the inside, nothing is going to change. You can stop doing certain stuff on the outside, but it doesn't mean that you have a changed heart. And in the sight of God, what matters most is a changed heart. You can put people on good behavior. You can teach people how to behave well. And they can do excellent in your presence. But does it mean they are changed? Somebody answer me. Does it mean they are changed? No. You know why? Because when you're not around, you're going to do the same thing. That's why when people sin, they don't sin publicly. They sin secretly. Why? Because that's the hidden things that we do secretly. But if a person have a proper knowledge and understanding of what I'm talking about and a change of heart, whether you are inside those doors or outside those doors, doesn't really matter because that's the real you. That's a brand new person, you, the part of you that knows God, fears God, trusts God, and because of it, your life has changed. Come on, somebody. I said, come on, somebody. Please don't let this message, you sit here and you agree with me and you say, that's wonderful. Let this guide you and lead you closer to the Lord. My heart is for the body of Christ to get closer to God, because if you are, you will never be offended. And I know what I'm saying. Why? Because you love him too much. 
Because you fear him too much. Because you don't want to upset him in any way, shape, or form. Intimacy with him is number one priority before your ministry, before your giftings, before your anointings, before anything that you can do. Is it possible that people can be used in the gifts without knowing him? Let me tell you this morning, yes, it is. Character don't change just like that. The change has to happen from the heart. And if the change doesn't happen from the heart, there is, will never be any change. They will desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. And they will stumble and they will fall away. And what next? Betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. We're talking about Christians. We're not talking about worldly people who don't know. We're talking about Christians. Is there such a thing as Christian will be offended and rebelled and they distrust and they desert the Lord and they stumble and they fall away and they betray one another and pursue one another with hatred? Is there a possibility? I was talking to a lady two, three days ago, four days ago, and she was telling me about a member in her family. She was the first one to come to the Lord. She was the first one to come to the Lord. And because because of her, many members of that family came to Christ. Because of her. During the COVID time, I don't know what happened. Then she began to withdraw. Withdraw to the point that if her sister would open the topic about the Lord or she opens the Bible, she will start fighting her sister and telling her, she close the Bible, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to know anything about it. Who was she? She was a believer. Do we deny that she was a believer? No, no, no. She actually was a blessing into my life. And we actually, when we first opened the church here, we called her and she ministered here. So what happened? What happened? What happened along the way? What happened? Let me tell you what happened. Give me verse 11, please. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive and lead many into error. Verse 12. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold. Yeah, I love you, Lord. I love you. But not to the point to obey you. Yeah, I love you, Lord. But don't tell me what to do. I, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. But that's how I feel I should be doing, so I'm going to do it. What's that? What's that? Where's the fire? Where's the fire of the Spirit? In the light of what's going on, the love of the great body of people will grow cold. You know, fire can be put off. And the fire of the Holy Spirit, if you don't constantly feed it, it will act eventually... It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in a week time. It might not happen in a year time. But nothing happens sudden. Everything starts somewhere, somehow. And if it's not caught and dealt with, and you keep following that up, eventually you will end up in a place where your love for God has already grown cold. The love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. Keep the fire in your heart burning. Don't use reasons and don't use excuses to justify yourself why you are in that place where your love for God has grown cold Please, I beg of you, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep trusting the Holy Spirit to keep burning the fire. I remember a few years back in a conference in Campbelltown somewhere, 
And the Lord had me to speak about the Lord commanding his people, keep the fire burning on the altar. Keep it burning on the altar. The fire can protect you. When the fire is going, nobody would dare come and put their hands in the fire because it's going to burn them. The fire of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit will actually protect you. It's a process. It's something that begins and you don't pay attention to it. How? Let me, let me just help you. How? How? All of a sudden, I don't feel like reading my Bible. Listen, we all go through that. Many times I don't feel like reading my Bible. But that doesn't mean I don't read my Bible. Okay? So you overcome that. You overcome that. You don't go by feelings. You overcome those feelings. What do you do? You actually get your Bible, open it. Someone was saying to me, you know, I just, I just can't, I can't, I can't open my Bible. I can't read. See, these are the signs that's going to lead to the great body of people will grow cold. These are the things that's going to start little by little. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like attending the prayer meeting today. I don't feel like this. I'm not going to do this today. I, 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 know, I know. Look, look, look. I know. That's what they said. I know. That doesn't mean that I don't love God. That doesn't mean that. I, no, no, no. It doesn't mean. Oh, don't judge me. Here's another one. Don't judge me. Well, judgment will come on people who refuse to judge themselves. If, if you find yourself, your appetite for God started to grow cold or there's no desire there, you are in a dangerous place. You can come to church, that's fine. But you are in a dangerous place. If you've lost your desire for God, which that desire, it, we have to stir up things in our heart to keep that fire, you know, burning so we can keep going and we can keep growing in the things of God. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous when you don't. Listen to that. I read this. Whenever... Whenever what you are doing for God replaces God, whatever you are doing for God replaces God, you run the risk of decreasing your intimacy with God. Now, this is an area that you cannot risk. Your intimacy with God, that has to be priority above anything else. Your relationship with God. I said something similar last week. This is what I said last week. Um, no matter what you lose in life, and if I would ask you this morning, some of you have lost many things in life. Some of you have also lost relationships in life. Some of you have probably been divorced. I don't know. But Whatever you lose, no matter what you lose in life, if your relationship with God is still intact, you're still a winner. You're still a winner. If your relationship with God is still good, you've maybe lost other things in the process in to gain God. And I love what Paul says. I, I've lost everything, my, even my education. I lay it all down. I don't want anything, even my education, to stand between me and God. Do you know your education? Do you know your credentials can stand between you and God? You become so unteachable that you know everything. All of a sudden, you know everything. And you're not open to the, to the Lord. And you're not open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So, if you've lost friends, if you've lost family, and I talked about that before, you know, sometimes you lose your family. Some, sometimes your family disown you because you're a believer now and you're a follower of Jesus. Some, some people think you've changed your religion because now you're following this and you're not following that. But actually what they fail to see, it's you weren't following Christ when you had your religion. 
Listen to me. You weren't following Christ when you had your religion. Religion doesn't lead you to Christ. The word of God does. And you know, it came to me, I was sharing this with my husband yesterday. And I said to him, you know, you know what? I don't know with my husband or somebody else. I said, you know what? Sometimes we hide, no, no, with Brother Isa. Sometimes we hide under the word Christian. People come to you and t- when I talk to you about it, say, well, I'm a Christian. Go talk to somebody else. I'm a Christian. And so we all, any denomination can hide under that word, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And I was thinking... When you say I'm a Christian, you, you, you're not actually pointing out anything. You're not, you're not different than all the other people who say I'm a, I'm a Christian. But what makes us stand out? What makes the believer stand out? Just by saying I'm a Christian and it don't on me. You know, I said, can somebody, if somebody will ask me, who are you? What are you? That will be my answer. I will not say I'm a Christian. I will say I'm a follower of Jesus. Yeah. You've got to be a follower of Jesus. What does that mean, follower of Jesus? That means you're disciplined in the things of God. That means you know the word of God. That means you follow what God says. When you follow somebody, that means you watch them, you follow in their steps. You follow them. You follow them. And when you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, that means I'm doing exactly what Jesus wants me to do. I am following him. I am following his instruction. I am not a Christian. Because this title or this name, it, it's got everybody covered. As long as we say, I'm a Christian, that means I'm okay. But the question is, are you a Christian? Or are you a follower of Jesus? What are you? What are you? Where is the place of the Word of God in the life of the follower of Jesus? Follower of Jesus, they don't create their own ways. Follower of Jesus, they follow the way. Who's the way? Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. I don't create something for myself. I follow His order. I follow His instruction. I follow His word. I follow His ways. Are you a Christian or are you a follower of Jesus? And nobody can answer that except the individual. After all, God will do a work in you individually it's not a family thing it's not a family thing God gave a promise to the family but it's not a family thing your experience with God has to be individual you cannot ride on somebody else's faith you cannot just make it because I have a member in my family who is a believer good for them but what about you what about you No matter what you lose in life, in your relationship with God is still intact. You're still a winner. And no matter what you gain in life, if you lose God in the process, you really lost. Don't lose God in the process. Don't lose God in the process. Don't allow yourself to say, well, I'm okay, I'm okay. I still come and I still do the cleaning in the church and I still help in the children's ministry and I still do this and I still do that. Don't let what you do take priority over your relationship with God. This is the message for the hour. Intimacy with Him. He's calling you. He's calling you. Even if you have to take time and sit until you rekindle that fire again. Until your desire for God will start to shift you and move you to a place. I just want to sit with Him. I just want to be with Him. I love Him so much. Nothing else matters. And your relationship will be so strong that God will begin to guide you from a place of intimacy.
whenever, whenever what you do are doing for God, replaces God, you run the risk of decreasing your intimacy with God. Can good works keep you away from God? Unfortunately, it does. I'm too busy. I cannot stand hearing that word again. People will always say, I'm too busy. Who isn't? Who isn't busy? Who isn't busy in life? People work long hours. People want to come home. They want to relax. They want to rest. Who isn't busy? But when you make time for God, it's a different story altogether. It, it, it goes prior to anything you do in life. It, you will run the risk of decreasing your intimacy with God. Be careful not to do so much for God that you miss Him in the process. Stand up with me. I read it last week, I read it the week before, and I'm going to read it this week. This is the cry of the Spirit that I hear. God is calling His church to a closer and more intimate, a deeper relationship with Him. He is saying, I want you. I want to know you. And I want you to know me deep down in your spirit. And stay connected to me by the Spirit. Every head bow, every eye close. I pray for you that you will hear that inner cry of the Spirit. God says, I miss you. I want you. Stop running for me and start spending time with me. I want our relationship to grow deeper. I want to know you more. I want to know you more, God. Is that the desire? One of the things that I said, which I will touch on next week, God's willing. When the psalmist in, in Psalm 73, I believe, he says, but it is good for me to, do, to draw near to God. So I want to be talking about drawing near next week. It is good for me See, I don't do it for you because it's good for me. I need to be strong. I need to be open to the Holy Spirit. I need to hear the voice of the Lord in my own personal life. It, the psalmist says, it is good for me to draw near. You're not doing anybody else's a favor if you study, if you read the word, if you pray, if you spend time in the presence of God, you're not doing anyone else a favor. It's good for you. And the psalmist says, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord and made him my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And that will be the points that we'll be discussing or talking about and explaining next week's message. This morning, make some decisions between you and God. Have you grown cold in your experience? Do you still come to church? You still give your tithe? You still do this? You still do that? But you know there's something missing in your life. You're not filled to the overflow. You feel like you've dried up. And it's not just that you feel you dried up. You've actually dried up. And that's why you are getting those feelings. You've dried up. You've lost your hunger. You've lost your desire. You've lost it on the way. Things got in the way and things got you out of the way. I don't know what it is. But God is speaking to you this morning. Listen to him. Listen to his voice. Follow him. Him. After all, church can't take you to heaven. Nobody can do anything for you. It's your faith in him. And it's your relationship with him 
that should be number one priority above anything and everything else. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed today's word. If you'd like to know more about what we believe, who Jesus is and how you can know him too, head to our website, voicetothenations.com.au. And if you'd like some prayer, you can also head to our website, voicetothenations.com.au forward slash prayer requests. Have an amazing day and we hope you tune in again soon.